the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and merciful God, we thank you for the gift of a new day. We thank you for your blessings upon us. We thank you for this Bible session that we are about to enter into. We continue to ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit, that twin spirit it was there at the beginning of creation, the spirit that created order, the spirit that brought newness and life to the world. We pray that you enlighten our minds on this day and you open up our hearts so that all that we shall learn we will appropriate for our lives and become better Christians and become stronger for it. We ask all these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So I call on the reader to very quickly start from verse 2 of the book of Genesis and read all the way to verse 31. A reading from Genesis chapter 1. The earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made a dome, and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky, to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. And let there be lights in the dome of the sky, to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, 
and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. The word of the Lord. Okay. I think we better get to the to the matter of today. First and foremost, I'd like to welcome you all to this session. Um, thank all those who have been making it here every Saturday evening by 6 p.m. I appreciate your presence. We have been reading from the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. It began last week. And just to give a quick summary of what we spoke about last week, we managed to deal with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 alone. And um, you can see that the word of God is very deep. The word of God is very rich. On reflection, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, there are many other things that open up. Just to say that truly this is the word of God, there are many angles that will always appeal to our senses, our sense of, um, you know, God. First and foremost, we spoke last week about Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, being the doorway, being the foundational verse of the Bible, being the most read verse of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, is that verse that helps you to enter into Scripture. It is the greatest miracle ever recorded anywhere, not just in the Bible that God created the heavens and the earth, makes every other miracle a piecemeal, a walk in the park. Because if you believe that God created the heavens and the earth, then it, you will not have any problem believing that Jonah survived three, three days in the belly of a fish, or that Moses parted the Red Sea, or that Jesus raised the dead. It is a fundamental belief, it's a foundational belief. In the beginning, God we spoke about God, how God is important, how God is first in the beginning, and attempts to remove God from the beginning is an exercise in futility. It only leads to irrationality when we try to remove God from the beginning. It means that we attribute many other things, or rather we attribute the existence of everything to other things apart from God. Sometimes it means that you have to say that things have come accidentally. So we spoke about the just so happened mentality, a mentality that any Christian should not have, a mentality that stands in sharp contrast to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Things do not happen by accident. Things happen from the conscious, the deliberate design of God. And then we spoke about, in the beginning, God. Created. We spoke about the word created, that beautiful rich word. Created is the Hebrew word bara, which means God created out of nothing all the things on the, of the earth. He fashioned them out of nothing. And that is a capacity that belongs only to God. It's an exclusive characteristic of God. Human beings cannot create. Rather, we make things. That is, we make things out of already existing materials, but only God can create. So it was our prayer that um, those things that only God can do, we will experience them in our lives. Um, we spoke about also heavens and the earth, how heavens and the earth are not too exclusively, you know, natural spaces. There are, there are spaces that overlap, okay? There are, there, are, there, are, there are spaces that overlap, heaven joined to earth. And that was the whole principle behind the Garden of Eden. God walked with them in the Garden of Eden. God was present in the Garden of Eden. So we move from there to verse 2. Verse 2, in which we begin today. Verse 2 says that the earth was without form and void. 
and there was darkness over the surface of the deep. When God created the earth, the heavens and the earth, we are told that the earth was without form and void, and there was darkness over the surface of the deep. There are three problems here. That the earth was without form. Secondly, that there was a void. And the third problem was that there is darkness. The reason why these are problems is because um, you cannot associate God with these three things. God did not create a thing that is without form. Okay? A thing that is disorderly. Okay? The earth was void. It means that it was empty. It was shallow. A place of chaos and confusion. Our God is not a God of confusion. Okay? And lastly, there was darkness over the surface of the Bible says that there was darkness covering the entire earth. God will not do that. Those are not actions of God. It is to say that the process of creation was the process of restoration of order. It brought order into a disorderly situation. It brought restoration to a situation of a situation of confusion. And then lastly, it brought light to the darkness that is in the earth. The truth is that when it says that the earth was without form and it was void, it was chaos and confusion and there was darkness, all these things are signs of the, the, the absence of God. Okay, so that even in the life of individuals, when you are experiencing certain darkness or a certain void, emptiness, chaos and confusion, lack of direction, and then there's complete disorder, whether in family life or whether in your work life or whether in your spiritual life, it is a sign of a life that has rejected God or the absence of God. Okay, so what God had in mind in creating was to put order into nature. And so you must pray for that order. You must bring God into your life before you can experience you know, order in the midst of disorder. You can experience stability even in the midst of confusion. And also you experience light even in the midst of darkness. We're not going to do it line, line by line um, interpretation of the scriptures today. So we'll just focus on some of those key things that we find from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 25. And um, see that after this statement in verse 2, we are told that God went on to his first act of creation. He said, let there be light, and there was, and there was light. How did Hello, God Luna. create how did God create light? How did he go about the creation of light? I'd like to introduce a principle to you, which you will find in God's act of creation. And that is the principle of separation. See, God was not only a creator. God was also a separator. Do not understand separation in a negative sense. Okay, not, it is not a negative separation or division. No, that's not what it means. Okay? You will understand what separation means by the time we get to the end. So God did not just create. God created by separating. He separated the light from the darkness. Genesis chapter 1 verse 4. So, you find that this is the same principle that is everywhere in the scriptures. On the first day, he separated the morning from the evening. And that is the meaning of the statement, there was evening and there was morning the first day. Okay? Separated day from night, separated light from darkness, separated the morning from the evening. You see how he's bringing order into creation. Initially, these things were mixed together. These things were confused. So if you're experiencing a confusion, know the kind of God that you have so that it separates the wheat from the chaff, it separates from the unimportant, from the, from the important, it separates the things that do not have value from the things that are eternal. Okay? 
see that God separated the waters above from the waters below. She continue. He separated the dry ground from the water that is the sea and the dry ground. He separated. He separated the surface from the sky. You see, even even in the lives of individuals, God set this particular pattern. You find it very clear in his future actions. Anybody he wanted to use, he first separated. He separated Noah's family from the rest of the world. Noah and his family were in the ark, and the rest of the world was out there. He wanted to use Abraham. He separated Abraham from his kindred. He said to Abraham, go, leave this city, and I will show you a place. So Abraham left. He separated him from his people. Even the children of Israel, who were the chosen people, God separated them from the rest of the world. If you have ever read Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 8, it says that when God divided the nations, he chose Israel as his firstborn son. He separated Israel from among the nations because he had a special purpose for them. And what is that purpose? It is that Jesus was going to come through the nation of Israel. Even in the New Testament, even before the New Testament, many other examples like Joseph and his brothers. Joseph alone separated from the 11 brothers. David was to be king of Israel. David was the only one that was not at home when Samuel came to anoint the king of Israel. David was separated from his brothers. In the New Testament, you find the same principles. The 12 apostles were separated from the 70. Okay? And Christians are people that are separated from the world. But in the end, even at judgment in the end, it is still the principle of separation. Okay? The separation of the sheep from the goats. So, what is the point of all of this? The point is that it's a, it is a principle that is in creation. It is one of the first principles of human life, even before human life came to be. See, God, God established those principles. And anybody who toys with those principles, you find that something will be amiss in your understanding of God and of life and and every other thing, you must understand the principle of separation. Okay? So, and we let God in this principle because God separated light from darkness. You too, separate yourself from darkness. You too, separate yourself from iniquity. Separate yourself from anything that is opposed to that God who created you in the first place. Understand the principle. Without the principle of separation, you cannot grow. Even Jesus understood it. He said, if your right hand causes you to sin, what do you do? You separate it from the rest of your body. If your eye causes you to sin, you separate it from the rest of your body. It's not a literal cutting off of your hand or, or plucking out your eye. But it is an understanding that there are some things that attach to you so closely that if you do not kill them, they will kill you. And so, that surgical cut that is needed, no matter how painful it is, must be done. It is a principle of separation. It is a, it's a principle that has been established since the beginning of the world. Okay? Even when God created man, we are told that he separated man from the rest of creation. God removed man from the rest of creation. Not just that, even man that he created, he, 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 he split man into two. He said male and female. He created them. He separated male and female from man. Okay? That is why there are some people who, at the same time, they want to be male and female. You see the confusion their lives. A man wants to change to a woman. A woman wants to change to a man. Forgetting the principle of separation. It is male and female that created them. Adam wants to marry marry Steve. Okay? The principle of separation. Um, or a Christian who, who, who engages in what is called syncretism. 
And criticism is being a Christian, and at the same time, you are, you are worshiping the gods in your village, the small gods in your village. Okay? You are a Christian, and at the same time, you are embracing other people's faith. That is a lack of understanding of the principle of separation. As I said before, this is not about racism. It's not about tribalism, Igbo, Yoruba, or Hausa, or Igbo have been separated from Yoruba. No, 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 no. It is an understanding of the fact that God sets apart that which he wants to use for his purpose. And to set apart is to make holy. That is the meaning of separation. To make it holy. What God wants to use is set apart. I think that is that. Another principle that we we find in the scriptures, or rather, in the book of Genesis, is the principle of naming. When God created the heavens and the earth, he separated the light from the darkness, and he called the light day. You might just read that and just gloss over it and just move on to, to other things, but that is very key. He called the light day. And he called the darkness light. He gave names to these things. To give a name is to, is to have, is to exercise power and authority over a thing. He created the firmament of the heaven and he called the firmament heaven. That was why when God created Adam and he gave Adam the Authority. You see that he had to give him the authority to give names to the animals. It is, it is a profound thing. It's a deep thing. That's why when you become a Christian, you take a new name. Your name changes. All over the scriptures, people God wanted to use, he changed their names. From Abraham, from Abraham to Abraham from Saul to Paul, okay, from um, Cephas, or rather um, Simon to Peter. They changed their names because they had an important task. So naming is very significant with the Bible. It indicates you know, a true knowledge of the thing that is being named. It indicates control over it. I understand in our own cultures how you know, we place great importance in naming. Most of our names have deep spiritual meanings. You don't just throw a spoon on the ground and the sound that it makes, you attach it to your child and say that is his name. Or a name that you do not know its origin, you do not even understand it, but because it sounds good to you, you just throw it upon someone. Okay? A name matters. And so God was the first to name because it is a deeply spiritual thing to name a thing. So when you're giving your child a name, you must pray about it. You must ask God to direct you, and you must give a name that is fitting, a name that will uplift the child. It is very key. Now, before God created, God spoke. If you go through all of the six days, all of the six days of creation, God spoke. He spoke and these things came into being. What is important for me in all of this is that before God said, let there be light, before he said it, no word, no voice, no syllable had ever been heard. No word had been heard no voice had been heard, no, no, no syllable, no sound, no whisper has been heard in the whole of the world. So there was an eternal silence. So that when God spoke, he broke an unbroken silence. A silence that has lasted for eternity. I know that there are many who experience the silence of God. And it is indeed a very trying time 
when we want to hear from God about it, about a particular situation, but we do not hear. We do not hear the voice of God, and it breaks our hearts. Our Lord Jesus Christ experienced the same on the cross. He called his Father, 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 why have you forsaken me? He did not hear the voice of the Father. And those who are dealing with the silence of God in any particular aspect of their lives, whether in your work life, whether in your family life, whether in your personal achievements, whether you know, in, the, in a particular instance you're experiencing the silence of God, this comes as a blessing to you because there was an unbroken silence. There was an eternity of silence and then God spoke. That same God will speak in your own situation. That silence will not be forever. So God is a God who breaks an unbroken silence. He spoke for the first time. And what happened? He said, let there be light, and indeed there was light. While I was, in, while I was doing my master's, I, I, I wrote a thesis. And um, the thesis was on speech acts. It was written by one man, I don't know if I can still remember his name. On John Searle, yes. He wrote a book titled Speech Acts. And basically the idea is that God is the first person to perform a speech act. What is a speech act? A speech act is, there are, in fact, there are words that perform actions. That is, we recognize that words are not only things that tell us the meaning of a thing. Words are not only descriptive, that is, they describe how things are, but that words also perform actions. And God is the first person to use words to perform actions. That is, he spoke and reality changed. He spoke and things were moved. He spoke and light was separated from darkness. It is very key to understand speech acts. That is, speech is capable of performing an action. You know my favorite verse in the Bible, the one about the centurion, the centurion when he came to Jesus and um, he said to Jesus, Jesus, you are a great man. You say to this one, go, and he goes. You say to that one, come, and he comes. You say to this one, do this, and he does it. You say to this one, jump up and down, and they jump up and down. You are saying them, but things are moving around you. Okay? So, it gives us an idea of the power of words. That words are capable of changing our very lives. Speech as God spoke and things came to be. That is also a principle you find in the entire book of Genesis. Okay? In the process of creation. And God said in the first day. And God said in the second day. And God said in the third day. Indeed, God will speak your own situation. Now, there is a second pattern that God created in the six days. You know, today we are focusing on those six days to see if we can um, exhaust, it, exhaust it. He created light on the first day, light in darkness. Okay? But I find that there is a pattern. I have not seen it before. I have not seen it before, but on a closer look at the scriptures, you find this pattern that God uses to create. The first day was light, separated light from darkness. But from the second day, you see that it started to alternate creation. You create things in the heavens, and then on the next day, you create a thing on earth. On the third day, you create a something in the heaven, and on that day, you come back to earth. Okay, God started to alternate orderliness, a pattern, a process, putting order into chaos. On the second day, God created the firmament. Just go to your scriptures. Look at it right now. Okay, he created the firmament and he called it heaven. At least he created something in heaven. That was on the second day. Okay. 
On the third day, he came to earth. He created dry land and vegetation. On the fourth day, he went back to heaven. Okay? He created the, the, the two great lights. In verse 16. Okay? That is the sun and the moon. And he like he just added the stars and also the stars. In the fifth day, he came back to earth again. And he populated the waters of the earth. So you see that there is heaven and there is earth. Second day heaven, third day earth. Fourth day heaven, fifth day earth. Which is to say, heaven first before earth, the spiritual before the physical. It is very key. It is a principle. God, God created the things that are above first before creating the things that are beneath. Do not upturn the principles that God himself has laid down. So, even in your decision making, heaven first. In your life, the things that you consider to be important, heaven first for the things of earth. What is the meaning of seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything else shall be added unto you? That is, see the things that are above first for the things that are within. It is a principle that is established by God. Up first before down. Okay? Now, on the sixth day, God was going from heaven to earth, heaven to earth. And then on the sixth day, God said, let us make man in our own image and likeness. In the creation of man, something in Father happened. God had been going from heaven to earth, from heaven to earth, and now he came to man. In man, God brought heaven and earth together. That is, the breath of God came from heaven, while the clay from which he created man came from the earth. I hope you understand that. When God creates solely things for the heaven, those things are spiritual. When God creates Solely for the things of earth, most of those things are material. Now, when it comes to creating man, that is the most important aspect of creation, God brought his breath from heaven and he brought the clay from the earth. He made, he molded the clay with his own hands and he breathed spirit from heaven. Which is to say, heaven and earth, they meet in man. A man must understand that, okay? that you are not just a product of the earth. You are not just clay. You are not just material. But you are a fusion of heaven and earth. You see, the problem is that if we, 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 we transgress these principles, these important principles, most times we transgress them either because we put the material before the spiritual or we do not understand the principle of separation or we do not understand the principle of naming. Okay? Important principles, first principles. Now this is another one. In the creation of man, he brought heaven and earth together. And that is very key. Do not neglect your spiritual aspect. Do not neglect, you know, the, the most important aspect, actually, because heaven is earth. Now, when God was to create man, he did not speak man into existence like he did for all the other things. He said, let there be light. He said, let the firmament be moved. He said, let the dry land you know, be separated from the waters. He said it, and it happened. But in the creation of man, he did not say it. He did not say, let there be man, and then a man appeared. No. He did not say that. Rather, God, you know, actively used his own hands to form man. Okay? Which is to say that before any human being comes to this earth, okay, God has actively put that person together. Okay, he has formed him, him or her, and he has breathed his spirit into that person. God did not 
speak a man into existence, you actively, you know, put together this person. That is why a child is a gift from God. Every single child, it is a principle in the book of Genesis. That is why every child and the life of that child must be treated as sacred. Because God woke up, sat down, took clay, put it together, and breathed the spirit. That is, it is a conscious, deliberate action. So, the life of any, anybody, from its natural beginning to its natural end, must never be looked down upon. Because it is God's deliberate work. That is very important. And that is why we can never support the evil of abortion. Because every life that surfaces on earth, God did deliberate work to bring it into being. Now, as we read through the six days, or rather, as as I was reading through the six days, something caught my eyes, and which is also an important principle, okay, in the first six days of creation. It is very important. And it is um, the creation of um, the trees. You might wonder why the trees, what is special about the trees? It is special for me because it caught my eyes and I think that there is a very important information there for us. Okay? And this is the information. That God created, or rather God established opportunities by his creation. The principle of opportunities. When God created the world, he created a world that is full of opportunities. And it came to me when I looked at the trees, the trees that he created. When you look at the tree, you find that there are many things that you can make from a tree. Okay? From it, you can make everything that is wooden. God never made a table. God never made a chair. He did not say, let there be table, and let there be chair, and there was chair. What did he do? He simply made a tree. And the rest is up to us. That is an important principle. Because if you miss it, you miss important things about life. The principle of the tree. The principle of opportunity. So the problem many times with us is that we'll be praying to God. We'll be praying to God for, for a chair. We'll be praying to God for a table. We'll be praying to God for money. God did not create money. God did not create a table. God did not create furniture. God simply created a tree. The rest is up to you. That is, the tree is an opportunity. When God gives you a tree, okay, you imagine what the tree, the tree can, can do. The tree can produce a table, it can produce a chair, it can produce a wardrobe, many things. It can even build a house. If God gives you a child, you imagine what that child can be. God gives you a spouse. You imagine what that spouse can be. God did not create money, but he gives you a brain. So you used to multiply you know, those gifts that he has given to you. Those gifts that can create money. Okay, so you sit down and be praying to God for, for money. Meanwhile, he has already given you the capacity to do so. He has provided opportunity. And you find that in the, one of the important things there's a lot of fish in the sea. They were created by God. If you do not stand up from your house and carry a net and enter into a boat and throw the net into the sea, you will not eat one single fish. Okay? It's an important principle of creation. The fish will not leave the sea and come into your house and enter into your pot of soup and then present itself for you to eat. So what is what, is, what does the tree tell us? The principle of the tree it tells us something very important. That God created a world of opportunities. 
And indeed, even your life itself, it's like a tree. Remember the promise, you're like a tree that is planted beside flowing waters. Okay? You get nourishment from heaven and from the earth. The sun is shining on the tree from above. Nutrients are coming from down below. You too, you are like a tree. Your life is a tree. You are, you are full of possibilities. When you understand that principle, you will not sit down and be whining and crying that I don't have this in my life and this is going bad and this is going south. You are a bundle of opportunities. It is the principle of the tree. Now, one last thing I would like to point out very quickly. We go to verse 2. Because all the principles I have mentioned, in one way or another, you find them in the six days of creation. Now, let us just do something very little in the seventh day. To go to verse 2, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it God rested from all the work which he had done in creation. Now, this is the final principle I want to teach today. It is the principle of rest. Principle of rest. Now, to the ancient mind, when they, when they hear that God rested, the first thing that will come to their mind eh? It's not that God just, after, after God did all the work, he was so tired, he just looked for one place to relax. And he lay down on a very nice mattress. No. To the ancient world, when they hear, when they read the book of Genesis and they hear that God rested, the first thing that comes to their mind is temple. You see, that's why you always need a background understanding of the social cultural context of the Bible before you can understand it. God rested does not mean that God looked for a place to sleep or God looked for a place to rest. God rested eh, is actually talking about the temple. And how is that so? The understanding is that God rests in his temple. Okay? The temples are built for God to rest in. The meaning God rests it is like it takes its place in the temple. So the temple is a place where God takes his residence. That is, God created the whole world. After creating everything in the world, he did not just move away. Rather, God took up his residence in that world. Okay? That world became his control room. That world became... Um, his command center. That was where God took up his rest. Okay? It is, it is important, the principle of rest. And um, if God created the world, and after creating the world, stood up and he moved into the world, he took up his rest, that, is, that was the place where he decided to dwell. Okay? God's rest is actually the rule of God. Okay? So when he created the world, he did not abscond and abandon the world. He took up his residence in the world, that is, the place where he will rule. It is very key, the concept of God's rest. You find the same idea of God's rest in the, in the entire scriptures. When God gave the Israelites rest from all their enemies, God gave the Israelites rest from all their enemies. It does not mean that he told them to go and take a nap. No. It meant that at that point in their lives, they experienced stability. Okay? That is, there was order in society. There was, they had some control over their own lives. They were not under any form of slavery. They were not under any form of oppression. God gave them rest from their enemies. It implies stability and control. So when Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you rest, 
It means that when you follow Christ, Christ will give you control and stability. In fact, it will elevate you to a certain level where you would experience you know, control over your, your own life. When Hebrew chapter 4 says that you have not yet entered into that rest, what it is telling us is that there's still a higher level okay, of experience of God that, um, that we can have in the kingdom of God. So rest is not the end of activity. It does not mean that God stops acting. Even Jesus said, I and my father are still at work. But rest is actually the rule of God. It is the active rule of God. Um, on the seven, when God said, when is it said that God rested? Um, it means that if God just created the world and it did not move in, it means that every other thing is nothing. Even creation is not important. Imagine just God just created the world and it did not take up its rest in the world. It means that everything did not matter in the first place. And um, that's why you know, the Sabbath day, the day of God's rest, is very key. It is the day that God moves in. God takes up his residence and it must be taken seriously. 